Yeah. So I have now started. Just it will come in for pressure. Let the people join in now. I'm starting, ma'am, Mr. Mani. Yeah, it has started. Okay. People are now coming in. You should see the participants are increasing now. Okay. But I think let, let's at least 30 yeah. to 50 participants join, then you start. Then okay. People are just joining. Yeah. I'm starting. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone, and good day to our overseas speakers and participants. I'm Sayona Philip, Chair of the Ethics and Quality Committee of Consulting Engineers Association of India, and your moderator for the day. On behalf of CEAI, I would like to briefly introduce the topic. The theme of today's webinar is Ethics and Integrity, Stepping Stones to Success and Sustainability. The objective of this webinar is to advocate ethical practices amongst the consulting fraternity and to convey that in the long run, ethics and integrity pays off. It enhances your credibility in the profession and will prove to be indispensable for the success and longevity of your organization. Ethical conduct relates to oneself at a personal level and at organizational level, it relates to an organization's own procedures with respect to its employees and stakeholders and while rendering services to customers. It necessitates compliance to ethical mm -hmm. business practices and attributes like transparency, integrity, trustworthiness, accountability, adherence to quality, timelines, codes and standards, and contractual commitments. Look around you and you'll find that invariably the biggest and best brands and the longest lasting successful companies are those that have been ethical in their practices and have earned the trust of their customers. For today's webinar, we will have some eminent speakers to throw light on various aspects related to this very interesting topic from their perspective. We look forward to your active participation in the interaction that would follow. With that, I would like to invite Dr. Ajay Pradhan, President CEAI, to give the opening remarks. A few words about Dr. Pradhan. Dr. Ajay Pradhan has three decades of experience in planning, designing, and implementing several infrastructure projects. He is currently president and CEO of C2S2 Consulting Engineers and formerly MD of CH2M Hill and Halcro India. He has been consultant to the Planning Commission, founder director and managing director for DHI India, among other prestigious appointments. After his graduate graduation in civil engineering, he has done his master's and doctorate in water resources engineering. Dr. Pradhan, I invite you to give your opening remarks. Hey, you are mute. You are mute at the moment. Dr. Pradhan, you're on mute. Dr. Pradhan, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. There was a, there got stuck. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Sanaji. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening. Welcome everyone participating in this webinar, which is very important for uh, all of us, which is uh, for a fraternity like engineering consulting professions, which is an ethics and integrity as stepping stones to success and sustainability. At the outset, let me thank my colleagues uh, and especially Sayonaji, who is the chair of our ethics and integrity committee, Mr. Umesh Srivastava Sahib, who is the co-chair of the ethics committee, 
of Consulting Engineer Association of India. I heartily welcome all eminent speakers and panelists who will be sharing the knowledge, experiences, and thoughts on ethics and integrity in the engineering consultancy practices around the globe. Uh, about uh, CEI, which is called Consulting Engineering Association of India, which was founded in 1960s, and it has over 60 years of legacy, and it represents the Indian engineering consulting professionals at the International Federation of Consulting Engineers, which is called FEDIC, headquartered at Geneva. And we have over 400 members, including organizations and individuals. Engineering is a profession that directly impacts all members of society. Engineers have tossed the products which you on daily basis and have vital impact on quality of life. Like many other professions, whether it's a medical profession, legal profession, or accounting professional, ethics and integrity is the first thing we please before we start our business. To uphold and advance the integrity of engineering profession, a code of ethics has been adopted by most engineering professionals and societies around the globe. In the past, Conflict between self-interest and public interest was seldom problem for engineers. Since engineering and engineering works were mostly synonymous with the human progress. Today, environmental issues have created a divergence between self-interest, employer interest, professional interest, and public interest. Therefore, the realistic is to expect engineers to display higher ethical standards than those normally expected of the wider community. And can individual ethics play a significant role in influencing technologies that are collectively shaped by professional paradigms and philosophies? Well, modern engineering codes of ethics require engineers to put the public interest before their personal and, uh, personal and professional and business interest. Most modern engineering codes of ethics states that engineers should hold paramount the health and safety of the public and the community at large. Just to give an example, Environmental impact assessment studies in India, which we have always appraised through the called uh, Supreme Court led Environmental Appraisal Committee, ESC, and the Minister of Environment Forest. Is, uh, each and every infrastructure process go through those scrutinized process through the experts and various regulatory process. Let's say, for example, the project proponent, he just come and commissioned a consulting engineer to carry out a environmental impact assessment and environmental management plan. The engineers working on that impact study project is therefore either directly or indirectly employed by a party whose interest may differ in six significant ways from the public interest. Therefore, the immediate objective of their employer or client would to get approval of this project and to go ahead of this uh, project, including uh, the environment impact. At some time, at, at times, it could be also against the environmental norms or the local residents against their wills. So that's a concern because the EI is done by the project component rather later in the project planning process. By then, the project proponent must have invested a huge amount towards the planning, carrying out detailed engineering, feasibility, and other things. Therefore, here, there's a point of that, uh, you know, the, the EA at this stage, the environment impact strategy, create an, an obstacle in the field of bureaucratic hurdles on the way to their goal. Therefore, what we need to do, keep in mind is that the EA is a public document and highly, it, 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 in our country, it is always scrutinized by local residents, bureaucrats, politicians, and environmentalists, and quite often by NGOs. At some time, some projects also go through National Green Tribunal, which is called NGT, and that also another layer of uh, environmental concerns. So these are the, 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 you know, under this premises, engineering consulting companies and engineers are working on various projects. So what is happening in current state in, in our profession, then more and more projects or infrastructure line is focusing more towards the environmental, social and governance issues in a framework to address the sustainable development goal of 2030. So this is, this is how we have been thinking to really run our ethics and it is going to play an important role. I'm confident that the presentation and deliberation would address various ethical integrity aspects and practices for consulting engineers to conduct their profession in the right manner. With this, I thank you all and wish you a good deliberation today evening. Thank you again, once again. Sairaji, back to you.
Thank you, Dr. Pradhan, for that perspective. You've also rightly brought out the focus on ESG and their importance in achieving sustainable development goals. Thank you. We will now have the keynote address. It is my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker for the day, Justice Geeta Mittal, former Chief Justice Jammu and Kashmir High Court and former Acting Chief Justice Delhi High Court. Thank you, ma'am, for accommodating us in your very busy schedule. A few words about her. Justice Mittal has had an illustrious legal practice in all courts and other judicial forums in India since 1981. Since her retirement in 2020, Justice Mittal has been heading a number of committees and regulatory bodies as chairperson. She was appointed by the International Senate of SOS Children's Villages, the said Federation's highest supervisory body, as a member of its Independent Special Commission in 2021. Justice Mittal's judgments have had a widespread impact on the rights of women, people with disabilities, and victims of sexual violence. She has been recognized internationally for her judicial interventions and innovations, among them in designing the vulnerable witness deposition complexes in trial courts in Delhi. She also spearheaded an initiative to bring justice to people living in remote areas of India by using technology to allow citizens to register their cases through local post offices and other service centers. These complaints are electronically transmitted to the court, which reads the petition, hears the petitioners electronically, and judicial orders are returned by the same mode. During her long and illustrious career, Justice Mittal has conducted programs on several topics of social relevance, including legal aid, gender and disability sensitization, the environment, disaster management, and the constitutional rights of the marginalized. Justice Mittal is a recipient of the prestigious Nari Shakti Puruskar Award, the highest civilian honor for women in India conferred by the President of India. She has done a BA honors from Lady Sriram College for Women in Delhi and obtained a law degree from the Campus Law Center in Delhi University. We look forward to hearing from you, ma'am. The stage is all yours. Thank you, Sayona. Namaskar, a day neutral greeting from India to friends who are abroad. Some of you very early in the morning and some of you have joined at almost midnight, I understand. I have been given this opportunity to speak to all of you on a topic which is extremely dear to my heart. It is, a, it is something on which I have spoken on a large number of occasions and I always have a lot to say, but I have to speak with the eye in, on the clock. It is my immense privilege and pleasure to be uh, part of this today's webinar. I thank Sayona Philip, Chairperson of the Ethics and Quality Committee who very kindly invited me to share my views and experiences with you. A lawyer for 23 years and a judge for 16 years, ethics and integrity have personally been my guiding principles to what people would normally consider a very successful career. So what are ethics and integrity? A brief word. Ethics provide the framework, the set of moral principles, a framework mutually accepted by the system one works in, while integrity is a personal value, the quality of being honest, the very fabric that one is made of. Ethics can be codified into a set of accepted rules, but integrity is an individual quality, a personal moral code. Together, they constitute the reason why society can still subsist and survive with a large amount of predictability. Else, we would be living in a state of anarchy and perpetual chaos. I'm deeply impressed to be part of the effort of the Consulting Engineers Association of India in attempting to create value via driving for the ethics and integrity in the profession of engineers in India. It is so heartening to see ethics and integrity at the forefront of its conversations and deliberations. Some personal values. As a lawyer, I advocated for the legal rights of the aggrieved. While as a judge, as an adjudicator, I adjudicated between conflicting rights of disputing parties. Either way, I had no choice. The guiding light was the rule of law. Law is nothing but codified common sense, as much as code of ethics and integrity. 
one should be able to look at a code and say, well, this is pretty obvious. That would be the true test of what one's inherent values are. When I joined the legal profession and subsequently became a judge, I definitely had to make choices at every stage. I learned to stand by the choices I made, even if they were frowned upon as being too ethically correct. Contrarians would oppose compliance, but as long as I was anchored in my base of values that I carried as a legacy from parents, education and readings, I was able to be fearless. It is not only my belief, but my experience that being ingrained in a value system, personal, social and professional is the single most fact empowering factor for any human being. The constitutional position as that of a judge of the High Court by itself distances you from reality. Overnight, you are transported from being into a being uh, transported into being a judge sahib. You touch no doorknobs to open any door. They are open for you. Personally, status and position have never mattered to me. I grew up in a very middle class academic family, which was so fertile in incredible values and rich in ethics. Throughout my years of judgeship, despite umpteen staff for assistance, I so easily made my own tea, my own bed, even what enjoyed washing my personal clothes while living in Lutyens, Delhi. I never ever used a PSO, that's a personal security officer, believing that the police constable was best deployed on police duties serving the people of Delhi. A high court judge in Lutyens, Delhi has no threat perception. I also did not use a red beacon after on my car after I learned that it was detachable. And for the most part, I carried refreshments for my office meetings from my home, both in Delhi as well as in Kashmir. I never used the court protocol facilities for friends and relatives. To cut a long story short, I lived a very ordinary existence, following my very own rule book. As Mahatma Gandhi would poignantly profess in practice, be the change you want to wish in the world. Unconsciously, perhaps I was following this dream. There is one very good example that I learned of somebody having very ethical values. Uh, something that we do so unconsciously, but it is accepted as being the norm and nothing, not unethical, which is to use an official phone at home to make personal calls. I learned of one person, the father of late Mr. Kirit Ravel, a former Solicitor General of India, who was a government servant. He bought postage stamps and kept them as a store in his house. Each time he used the, the official phone at home in his residence to make a personal call, he would tear up a stamp to compensate the government for the personal use of that phone. It's hard to find such examples. You may wonder why I'm sharing all these personal stories with you. I share as I made choices as a professional, even in the smallest of seemingly inconsequential decisions. I want to highlight that you too have the power of choice in you. Each time you are faced with a decision, however small it is, you have a choice to carry it out with ethics and integrity or follow in the trap of the new normal. To me, ethics starts with self. The engineering profession is one of the most stellar professions in the world, forming the bulwark of the world around us. Almost everything we see, touch, hold, use, live in is a result of an engineer's design and execution. Engineering is that silent force that creates the magnificent world around us. Therefore, it is inextricably intertwined with the lives of people, their convenience, utility, and their safety. It is therefore critical that ethics and integrity, besides skill and quality, are the four pillars on which this profession rests. Public safety has been a paramount issue that arises when we live in a world imbued with technological complexity, both in the physical and the virtual world. And the seed of that public safety lies in the hand of the engineer who is deputed with design and supervision of the execution. A very interesting formulation that I found while reading on this topic was by Heinz C. Lugenbeil, a philosopher, engineering ethicist, who proposed six foundational principles of engineering ethics, which are independent of any cultural context. And he I enumerated the principles which he formulated, the principle of public safety, of human rights, of environmental and animal preservation, of engineering competence, of scientifically founded judgment, 
of openness and honesty. Certainly these must be the norm and not merely principles propounded by a very learned engineer. This to my mind provides a base, useful basis for creating a framework. You know, human rights and environment may sound like softer principles in this hard corporate driven world, but they assume greater importance as we progress. Take a classic case of conflict between a lower cost design of infrastructure as opposed to an environmentally friendly option, which costs more. The moot issue for engineers involved would be whether to follow the desire of the owner to make profits or to uh, min, uh, project to minimize costs or to be true to the demand of ethical framework. No easy answers, but certainly require a deep meditative awareness of the ethical demand. And if complied with honestly, will go a long way in innovating to the benefit of the environment. And that's the contribution of an ethically driven engineering mind, not profit driven. I have always believed that charity begins at home. Let us look at some indicators for the corporate world, for the engineering world. Please ask yourselves, is there gender equality in appointments and promotions in your organization? Have you mainstream disability? Do you undertake a gender or a disability or an environment audit or environment impact assessment of your workplace? Have you put in pl place zero tolerance areas, say for sexual harassment or energy waste? Is there an effective grievance redressal mechanism for your staff? Do we empower stakeholders as are em uh, including the employees to participate in our decision making? Do we comport to labor laws that is pay minimum wages? Do we give proper maternity and paternity leave? Do we have childcare rooms for lactating mothers or creches in our organization? Do we permit flex hours? All these considerations are a essential part of ethical corporate conduct. We in India are aware of the Bhopal gas tragedy. Let us assume the disaster could not have been reasonably foreseen, but look at the irresponsible conduct of the corporate. The union carbide has left pools of, wa uh, of waste you know, after the gas leak. Even today you see pools of toxic waste percolating into the groundwater. Ancient Indian culture was not based on competition, but on collaboration and coexistence. Competition has been nurtured by capitalism, which has brought in its wake corrupt practices, unethical acts, acrimony, malafide, the guiding force being maximize your profits. The engineer is a master of his craft, which no other can replicate and therefore is indispensable. That position ought to be empowering, not passive. The engineer as a creator- Man, you have five more minutes. Material world has the power to assert and thus transmit ethics and integrity into his or her creation. As a retired judge, I must point out the textbook definition of the words integrity and ethics. This is a, not the definition, but an example. We are all aware of what happened in 1975 when the constitutional fundamental rights of the, of the citizens were suspended. The issue regarding the availability of the right to approach courts for violation of the right to life was a consideration before the Supreme Court in the famous case of ADM Jabalpur versus Shivkant Shukla. The majority of the judges, that is four, infamously held that in a situation of emergency, citizens had no right to approach the courts. Justice H. R. Khanna was the sole dissenter. This dissent led him, this ethical dissent led him to losing his opportunity to becoming the chief justice of the country. But this decision immortalized him. This was ethics in its highest avatar. Ethics and integrity were the stepping stones to successful, to success and sustainability. We as human beings revel in blaming others for our behavior. We are lazy because colleagues are lazy, lie because seeing the, we see truthful ones being punished. We are aggressive because people perceive kindness as a sign of weakness. I'm corrupt because the system is corrupt. I'm selfish because that is how the world is. We blame the system, colleagues, bosses, friends, random people around us for everything. But see where we find ourselves today. We live in a Machiavellian society where no one trusts anyone, where no one cares for anyone, where treachery can pay. There is no compelling economic reason to be ethical, tell the truth or keep one's word. Punishment for the treacherous in the real world is neither swift nor sure. Therefore, 
I would like to quote as Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor, stoic philosopher and author of meditation said, and I quote, live a good life. If there are gods and they are just, then they will not care how devout you have been, but will welcome you based on the virtues you have lived by. If there are no go if there are gods, but unjust, then you should not want to worship them. If there are no gods, then you will be gone, but will have lived a noble life that will live on in the memories of your loved ones. Mahatma Gandhi had proposed the idea of trusteeship versus charity, a concept where he said, God is the master of all wealth and material universe. According to him, wealth does not belong to the businessman. He is rather the person entrusted with managing the wealth for the welfare of the society, namely a trustee. This is the principle which was adopted by industrialists of that era, which included the Birlas, the Tatas, the Loyas, who built organizations that have not lasted generations, but have also driven change in society, created impact. In foreign territories, you see organizations like Cadbury's, Toyota, Sony, Samsung, Nokia, Raventry, Hyundai, Boots, Rockefeller, Beecham, General Electric, amongst others, which have anchored the economies of these countries to make them sustainable. To me, it is organizations as this which have achieved success and sustainability <coughs> only because they followed principles of ethics and integrity. The percentage of Indian companies making valuable contribution to CSR is more than anywhere in the world. We are aware of the example of Infosys, which con conducted its carbon footprint analysis in 2007, found 49% of its energy demand came from air conditioning, started working towards the goal of carbon neutrality. In October 2020, Infosys announced that it is now carbon neutral, earning it a place in the prestigious Dow Jones Sustainability Insys. We are also seeing a rise in the economic, social governance investments, which we are aware, uh, the experience has shown, data has shown that uh, uh, corporations which make a uh, investment in sovereign wealth funds do uh, opting for ethics and integrity do better in a period in a long period of time tata One trust holds 66 percent of the wealth of the tata group which flows into the community projects these are all instances where which show that wealth can be created by integrity ethics pioneering responsibility and lastly unity as is evident from the motto which tata follows leadership with trust Thus, doing good for society also delivers profit and vice versa. There are enough proof points to prove that being ethical and working with integrity is a good strategy for long-term success. To conclude, I may also remind you of Sridhar Vemu, who has built Zoho from a humble cottage, a bicycle. And the, the, more, the model, therefore, is eye on the sky, desire for excellence, consume what you need, and live by ethics. The first step to economic success is intent and then working on it with integrity, following ethics, and of course, good luck. To conclude, in conclusion, I will ask my esteemed friends to introspect, step back, and think about their own codes of ethics and integrity. We know it delivers long-term success, but to act with ethics and integrity is a choice you make at every step of your profession. It is your choice and yours alone. O.W. Holmes rightly said, he, I quote, what lies behind us and what lies before us are small matters compared to what lies within us, unquote. Leading and delivering with integrity following the 17 codes of eth code of ethics in the areas of responsibility towards society, responsibility towards profession, competence, integrity, impartiality, relationship with other consultants, relationship with clients and relationship with employees is the bedrock of ethics. And it takes me great, gives me great pleasure that organizations like the CIEA have taken it on themselves to champion such a value system. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Namaskar. Thank you very much, ma'am, for that very inspiring talk, especially the six foundational principles of engineering ethics as spelt out by Heinz Lugin Biel. It was interesting to learn from your life's experiences and your practices. We would be very happy to have you remain for the rest of the session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We will now move on to the panel speakers. We will first have the panelists speaking for a few minutes, 
and thereafter participating in the panel discussion. We'll take questions after the panel discussion is over. Our first speaker is Professor Madhu Bhalla, Chairperson, Transparency International India. Transparency International is a global movement with the objective of ending the injustice of corruption by promoting transparency, accountability, and integrity. Professor Madhu Bhalla was professor in Chinese studies at the Department of East Asian Studies, Delhi University. She has an MA and PhD from Queen's University, Canada. She has held a visiting fellowship at the Fudan University, Shanghai, and has been visit, visiting scholar at the University of Sichuan at Chengdu. She has served on the Executive Council of the Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis in New Delhi, and is on the advisory councils of the China Centers at IIT Madras, MG University, Kotiam, and Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi. She is currently editor of the Indian Quarterly, India Quarterly published by the Indian Council of World Affairs. She is actively involved in enactment of conflict of interest law and implementation of the UN Convention Against Corruption in Letter and Spirit. Professor Madhubhalla will talk to us about the objectives of TI and what it does. Professor Bhalla, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Phillips. And thank you for the invitation to speak with all of you and to be part of this, uh, this discussion here. But since we have very little time, I'm going to cut short all the thanks and assume that you all know I'm thanking you and uh, just move very quickly to uh, talking about TI. Uh, Transparency India was at one point a chapter of Transparency International uh, headquartered in Berlin. We have since um, severed that connection um, and um, we are very much on our own trajectory. Uh, we were founded in 1997, and uh, essentially we had uh, two or three objectives. One of them was to, sorry, why are you doing this? I'm sorry, uh, am, I, am I audible at all? Ma'am, you're audible. They are just sharing your presentation. Okay. Okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Right. So we Please put we, it in slide mode. Yeah. Okay. So we basically started off with three or four objectives. And one was that uh, we would work towards zero tolerance of corruption in society and within governance. Uh, we also believe that corruption has victims, both those who are corrupt and those who corrupt. Uh, that all bribes actually, wherever they occur, embed corruption in the system. And that essentially fighting corruption is not a single, uh, you know, single institution's responsibility, but it is actually a systemic challenge. So um, uh, in a sense, we defined uh, our anti-corruption activities very broadly. Uh, they were both social, uh, they were uh, linked to governance issues, they were linked to uh, the way in which uh, institutions uh, behaved. And um, we therefore, have this little screen here that indicates how we thought about corruption and integrity. And we felt that integrity was at the heart of any kind of anti-corruption activity or anti-corruption initiative. And, anti and national integrity was actually based on many, many, many factors. It wasn't just what governments did, it wasn't just what individuals did, but it actually was a case for, and all of the, um, you know, and, and all of the system's response to integrity and to honesty. Uh, a lot of it depended on the rule of law and how law was implemented and how law was expected to be implemented within society. Uh, and uh, many of these things depended, of course, depend of course on education, how legislators function, how judici judiciary functions, and whether in fact uh, all of our institutions are actually uh, have the objective of following sustainable development goals. Um, uh, you know, uh, within their framework of action. Uh, we also feel that a lot of uh, our anti-corruption anti initiatives uh, have to do and must do with raising public awareness and with actually uh, creating a discursive, uh, uh, you know, just uh, debates on social values. Uh, 
So a lot of what we do has to do with dissemination. A lot of what we do has to do with advising other organizations. And a lot of what we have to do, uh, we, what we do uh, has yes. to do with uh, talking to legislators, to talking to opinion makers, and to networking with other organizations who are also stakeholders in some way or the other in integrity and honesty in, uh, in society. Next. Uh, our uh, major pillar actually is the Integrity Pact. It was devised by uh, Transparency International in 1998. And essentially it was aimed at helping governments, businesses, civil society fight against corruption in public contracting. Uh, because that's where we felt the largest amount of corruption happened. And uh, that we also felt was the area where, um, uh, where which was the most uh, obtuse in terms of its functioning, most non-transparent in terms of its functioning. And we had to shine a light in that area to make it more transparent, to make tenders, tendering, et cetera, more transparent. And to have all public sector units, which in India had large procurement uh, needs, um, to actually, um, uh, you know, to actually be much more transparent in the way in which they manage their procurements. Uh, as a result, about 55 uh, public sector units signed MOUs with us. And, uh, you know, one of the important things that happened was that as public sector units started to sign MOUs with us, my members are understanding with us on the integrity pact, the government found that it would be useful to make it mandatory for all PSUs to sign the integrity pact. Um, we also, um, you know, are very active in advocacy and legal advice. And we have a center called the ELAC, uh, where um, we welcome individuals, institutions, organizations, um, who seek advice on um, how to use the Right to Information Act, how to uh, file uh, public interest litigation, and how to actually use the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the social sector initiatives of the government effectively within organizations and within social groups. Ma'am, um, you have one more minute. Yes, sure. Uh, and then we have Pehel, which is actually uh, uh, an initiative that uh, promotes grassroots intervention. And uh, we, of course, do a lot of training on ethics and anti-corruption within organizations and within institutions. And then we have our annual lecture, which is our standalone, a big event. Uh, we, can we, we, can, we can just go through this one quickly, and I'm, I'm not going to go discuss this one. Uh, this is the Integrity Pact, which is uh, the agenda of uh, the, the objective of the Inte Integrity Pact is sort of outlined in this slide. Can we go to the next one? Uh, we uh, work uh, from the premise that India's rank in the Corruption Perception Index is not very good. Uh, we have, although we have improved since 2011, as a consequence, of some of the transparency legislation um, that has been enacted, like the RTI, for example, the Anti-Corruption Act, for example. But we also find that um, the political class has consistently whittled down the uh, teeth that the RTI was given and the Anti-Corruption Act was given. So in a sense, we are fighting an uphill battle with the governing class here in terms of tightening anti-corruption legislation. Next, please. Um, we carried out a survey in 2019, 2020 uh, to ascertain the level of domestic corruption in the country. And we had a very, uh, we, and the results were fairly dismaying actually. 51% of, uh, of citizens said that they had paid a bribe in the last 12 months with property registration, police and municipality being top departments, which means that really the level of corruption within governance and governance structures was the highest, not so much between private individuals. And the key, uh, the, uh, the states which had the highest uh, bribery were actually the states which were the largest states, Rajasthan, Bihar, Karnataka, for example. Next, please. Um, we have found that since, um, since uh, the year 2015, 
which was a year in which the highest number of cases were reported under the Prevention of Corruption Act, the reportage of these cases have considerably gone down. And the year 2020 indicates to us the lowest number of cases reported. Partly this has to do with the COVID when people were not able to get out and actually report these cases, but partly it has also to do with the fact that our enforcing um, uh, enforcing institutions have not been willing to register the number of cases that people wanted to register. Next, please. Um, and uh, same thing, you see the same uh, tendency here, um, cases under the Prevention of Corruption Act 1988 till 2020, the number of cases have actually gone down. And this is despite the fact that we do know that under COVID, there were enormous cases of corruption that happened in the medical fraternity itself and in the medical framework itself. Let's let's move on. Okay. Uh, and these are some more, uh, some more um, uh, statistics on uh, cases registered by the Anti-Corruption Bureau. Uh, and again, we see that the number of cases have actually gone down. Um, and the low conviction rate we find is because of the national average um, uh, um, sorry, the, the number of cases registered um, has been low, but also that there has been a very low number of cases that have gone up for trial. So there are many, many issues that pertain to how the, our judicial system functions and our police system functions. Go on, please. Um, these are the components that we think are the components of business ethics, and they are fairly holistic, actually, in, 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 in terms of how we perceive this. Um, I think much has been said on this by Justice Mittal, so I will not actually repeat many of these things. But uh, certainly, I think this holds true for uh, business communities and for business institutions. Next, please. Um, what we, uh, what our strategy is in the long term and in the medium term is to actually identify corruption hotspots and to, uh, to encourage uh, uh, government to improve systems and procedures uh, to report and to uh, deal and to redress uh, uh, grievances, to limit and reduce and eliminate discretion in decision making and abuse of power. And a lot of this has to do with discretionary powers within government bodies. Um, and uh, I think finally, I think most importantly, I think what we need to do and what we hopefully will do eventually is to insist on a disclosure of conflict of interest in public office. And this remains, I think, the biggest issue, uh, which uh, and nobody in the political class is actually willing to accept and legislate on. There is one private member's bill that has been hanging within the in the Lok Sabha for many, many years and is revived by the private member. But uh, no political party has uh, actually voiced any support for the conflict of interest legislation. Uh, and finally, I think uh, what we also need to do is have very, very effective legislation on whistleblower, whistleblower protection, because without actually being able to protect whistleblowers across all bodies and across the gov uh, government structure and within business institutions and within corporations, it is, um, uh, it's, it's fairly clear that fewer and fewer people will come out and talk about uh, indiscretions, um, you know, non-integrity issues, et cetera, et cetera, within institutions. So there's a lot of work to be done, it seems to me. A lot of legislative work to be done, a lot of support work to be done, a lot of dissemination to be done. And hopefully, you know, as we grow as an institution, as a body, we will be able to do that. But we would love to seek partners across organizations, um, which, you know, could assist us and actually be part of our debate on anti-corruption. Thank you. And again, Gandhi, right at the end. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, Professor Balla. That was a very interesting presentation. You explained about the activities of the Transparency International with the noble objective of monitoring corruption so that countries are encouraged to work towards ending it. Hopefully, that includes India. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, I would like to uh, tell the panel speakers that we are. Uh, running quite late, uh, I would request you to please um, maintain the time. I will give you a reminder after four minutes so that you can quickly wind up. I would like to go now to our next speaker, Mr. Lyndon White, member FIDIC IMC and ADR Australia. 
Mr. White, thank you very much for joining us. If I may say so at an almost ungodly hour for you from Australia. A brief about Mr. White. Mr. White has 36 years of experience as a civil engineer and the ADR and collaborative contracting practitioner on construction, ONM projects for roadways, tollways, railways, airports, etc. He has worked in Australia, the Pacific, Sub-Saharan Africa, South America, South Asia, including India, Southeast Asia and USA, using standard forms and bespoke relationships and hard dollar contracting mechanisms. A Juris Doctor, Master of Engineering Management, Fellow of ICCP, and has a particular interest in the intersection between transparency and the privacy of individuals under Article 12 to the Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, Mr. White will be talking about a systemic approach to integrity. Mr. White, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Ms. Philip, and thank you to everyone that has spoken before me. Uh, just a, a few quick words, and I think there's some slides there that we can talk through as well about engineers and the way that we can approach integrity, ethics in a systemic manner. Uh, we heard some definitions from uh, Judge Middle earlier on about what ethics are, what integrity is, but it's, it's just not that simple to say that a particular definition applies. And it's all about the way that we work with each other in society. So when we define, or when we have definitions, we need to think about what it is that we're trying to capture. And so, for example, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption mentions ethics, mentions integrity, mentions morals, but doesn't actually define those. And this is a very powerful document that's in the public domain that people refer to often. And, and of course, many jurisdictions rely upon that same convention to develop their legislation around integrity and transparency. But the, the definitions that we're talking about here are sometimes a personal perspective as opposed to a hard line. So if we think about the word ethics, which apparently originally emanated from the, the Greek word of ethos, which was about character. Uh, and then that's really about the practice of a custom of a community. Um, you know, the things that we judge, good or bad, right or wrong, and then those rules of conduct that are recognised in respect to a particular class of people or humans that interact with each other. So that's ethics. But just thinking now a little bit to morals, and because the definition of ethics talks about morals, it's from the Latin mores, which is about customs and conventions, uh, particularly in relation to groups. So something like CAI, uh, you know, has an ethical approach on things, uh, but it also has that underlying moral aspect where there's beliefs that are held by individuals to what is right and wrong, as opposed to what's prescribed. Um, so when we think about how we define integrity, it's about, in an engineering sense, being practical. So it's not just a a theory or something in the ether that says, oh, maybe we should do this one day, but it's actually thinking about what we do on a daily basis. So if we think about aspects such as honesty and truthfulness in engineering and the way that engineering inputs and outputs are, are applied, that's really what the CEAI is saying. And, and most recently, the CEAI has republished its code of ethics. And I think that's a fairly frequent thing that it's always to check, improve, and if you don't have your own code of ethics within your own engineering firm or environment, I recommend going to an organisation like the CEAI to use their code of ethics as a basis. So when you're looking at integrity, it's the practice of being honest and showing a consistent and uncompromising adherence to that. So examples of acting with integrity might include something as simple as refraining from sharing secrets and confidential information with others. It can be so simple in, in a meeting, dealing with a client, dealing with a contractor, where the engineer has an obligation to remain, uh, to keep things confidential. But at the same time, if that information isn't shared in a particular way, there may be a, 
a disruption to the way that the work is delivered. So it's about thinking about how you would do that. Um, and it's also, you know, avoiding relying on uns unsubstantiated information about others too. So if in some circumstances we see published information saying that a particular group of organisations may or may not be uh, dealing with others with integrity, it's about making your own inquiry too, making sure that the information that is before you is actually reliable. Uh, and finally, not by means the least, it's always good to follow through with your promises and commitments. That's another part of integrity. It's another part of being ethical. Um, and, and one thing that sticks in my mind from years ago from studying at uh, the University of Queensland is that the entry to the law building is a statement in Latin also translated to English that says, great is truth and mighty above all things. So in our foundations of learning, we have this concept of truth, you know, encouraging people to, to be truthful. And then it was interesting when Ms. Philip and I and the rest of CAI were talking about this particular webinar, talking about practical examples. Um, One minute. Yeah. I had a look at the Oaths Act of 1969 in, in India. And it provides that whole concept of truth, which again relates back to the way that we deal with each other with integrity. So a systemic approach to integrity for engineers includes four simple steps, four simple components, which are leadership, which are involvement, which are documentation, and then monitoring of that for improvement. So when we think about integrity and how it applies to the engineering sphere. It's such a simple thing to do if you can make a systemic approach to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. White. That was very interesting. You have uh, defined ethics and integrity very clearly with examples and brought out the importance of a systemic approach to integrity. So we'll go on to our next speaker, Mr. Umesh Srivastav, uh, Chairperson, Ethics Subcommittee, and former President of National Association of Consulting Engineers. Most participants here would know him. Mr. Srivastav is Executive Chairman and Founder of Holtec Consulting. The company has been active in the cement industry since 1967. Mr. Shivasav is a member of the President's Council of CEAI. He has served on the governing councils of several professional bodies. In recognition of his service to the consulting fraternity, the Lifetime Achievement Award has been conferred on him by CEAI, the IIT BHU Alumni Association, and the Indian Cement Review. Mr. Shivasav's topic is Ethics and Integrity, a game changer for consulting companies. We are waiting to hear from you, Mr. Shivasta. Mr. Shivasta. Yep. Thank you, Sayana. I'm proud and delighted to be here. Uh, on this occasion and in this webinar, which is very, very topical. In fact, it is always topical, not only today, but always. Uh, I have a little variation in my talk, not only talking about the success and the sustainability, but uh, I would also be talking about uh, what exactly uh, we as uh, consulting engineers ourselves can do and should do. Uh, definitions, I will go to the classical definitions but uh, I have tried to, uh, let's call it, paint the canvas with a very broad brush. 
and uh, the engineering terms or the terms which are used uh, in this presentation, uh, they will be very, very briefly defined. Uh, and in fact, not the classical dictionary definitions, but what they exactly do. Uh, the engineering consultancy itself is the practice uh, of uh, engineering consultancy, which is performed by the consulting engineers, planning, design, construction, what have you. Engineering services are aimed to benefit the society through safer, cleaner, ethical designs and engineering practices. The skill of uh, consulting engineers uh, is very widespread. It is technical, organizational, communicational, uh, IT related, planning, time management problems, et cetera, et cetera. As far as ethics are concerned, primarily the moral principles governing behavior and conducting an activity. And ethical principles include respect, kindness, fairness, justice, courage, etc. And the business ethics particularly relate to trustworthiness, fairness, integrity, law abiding, responsibility for environment, etc. There's a huge list, but then just a few key words have been placed here. The safety and health invariably are paramount as far as ethics are concerned. The integrity basically uh, means standing up to what you believe is right and living by your highest values. Integrity in engineering includes all these things like design, assurance, verification under stated operation conditions. Success is very widely defined and success can mean uh, different things for different people. But here, broadly, what I mean by success is uh, something which you like yourself, liking what you do, liking how you do. Success means courage, determination, and the will to become the person you believe you are or you want to be. And success also means continued expansion of happiness in life. As far as sustainability is concerned, it is the concern for profitability, but in harmony with environment and social commitments. Uh, social goals themselves uh, are environmental, economic, as well as social. You need a guide for all these decisions and you need this guide not only for um, your country's level, but you require this for global level. There is a focus on present needs. Uh, and that means that you do take care of the present needs, but without compromising on the needs of the future generation. One minute, Mr. Shivaskar. Okay. The game changes. A person, an event, an idea, a procedure that affects a significant shift in the current way of performing an activity, maintaining ethics and integrity, as for example, you take all these people like Maradona or Sehwag, they did something which changed the concept of the game, the way the game is played. And for instance, Dilip Kumar in field of acting. No one else can sort out these problems for us. The problems have to be sorted out by ourselves. We have to play the role of the game changers ourselves. The importance and urgency have to be felt at all levels. We have to define equitable uh, new norms and obtain full support through various consulting associations. All major consulting companies, if they unite and have courage of conviction, the concerned agencies who are governing us or who are dealing with us will have to finally agree to the modified rules for carrying out the consultancy business. Who were Gandhi and Nelson Mandela when they started their movements? I'll conclude with uh, one small couplet. I'll say first in Hindi and then I'll uh, translate it for you. Abhi na poocho humse. Abhi na poocho humse. Manzil kaha hai? Abhi to humne chalne ka irada kiya hai. अभी तो हमने चलने का इरादा किया है ना कभी हारेंगे 
और न हारेंगे कभी ये किसी और से नहीं ये हमने खुद से ही वादा किया है ट्रांसलेटेड इट वुड मीन डोंट आस्क अस नाउ वेयर अवर डेस्टिनेशन इज एट दिस मोमेंट वी हैव जस्ट रिजॉल्व टू वॉक टू मूव अड एंड दैट इज टेकिंग ऑल दीज डिसीशन विच वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट we have never lost we have never been defeated we will never get defeated this is our promise not to anybody else but to ourselves thank you very much thank you mr shivastav that was a very interesting talk i would now like to invite our next speaker ms tara hok general counsel american society of civil engineers Ms Hoke is general counsel at the American Society of Civil Engineers she is a graduate of Georgetown Georgetown Law and a member of the Virginia State Bar in addition to serving as AC's legal counsel in areas of employment tax contract and intellectual property law Ms Hoke oversees AC's professional conduct committee and writes a monthly column a question of ethics which is published in the civil engineering magazine She also serves as secretary for the Committee on Public Ethics, a UK-based charity that provides ethics guidance for scholarly publishers. Ms. Hope, we wait to hear your perspective on the topic, the ethical workplace culture. You have five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, again, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this uh, this really important and interesting webinar. um and i only hope i um add value to the webinar um so in many respects i will say that my experience at and i hope my screen is being shared right now um in many respects i would say that my perspective um uh, my um experience with engineering ethics is a little bit um distorted disproportionate i i think by and large engineers um ethics is very top of mind for engineers and engineers are very um you know again engaged and active in in representing you know in, in being ethical and and representing ethics in their lives but um what most of what i end up writing about and most of what my experience level is is about the failures um and unfortunately you know there are some um some extremely noteworthy cases um that that demonstrate engineering ethics failures or what you might call an engineering ethics failures um these are these are some examples and i know i don't have time to um probably each one of these um could be its own one hour webinar um um if you have never done some I, i would highly encourage you to do some reading on these if you are interested all interested um i think you can learn a lot from and there's been a great deal of reading about many of these cases and of, and of course i'm talking about um um just for those of you who don't maybe don't recognize some of these symbols on Volkswagen um very high profile um re- regulatory failure they um you know basically they um engineered the cars and they were unable to meet some very important emission standards and so they um codified a cheat into the system so that the vehicles would know they were being tested um and they would pr- produce different emission results um than they were actually getting on the road um bp is just an example and gm are both issues of safety failures uh, bp talking about um you know deep water um platform explosion um oil leak um the boeing 737 max is a, an example of a you know a very um dangerous uh, as we've seen technical failure um it, that was in the these planes um and that was kind of allowed to pass through because of um various failures uh, and then of course C- Siemens and Odebrecht are are just illustrative examples of of corruption uh, procurement fraud uh, bribery um in in engineering environments um uh, every single one, so 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 that's a big spectrum of the different you know very different types of ethical failures um what do they all have in common um to me it's about workplace culture um ethics violations do not happen in a vacuum um or at least rarely it's rarely the case that a single engineer acting you know independently um crosses a line um it's almost always um endemic it's always almost always a systemic institutional failure um and so corporate culture to me is the 
I mean, is the, I will say is the most important thing. If you're looking to prevent or reduce or mitigate ethics failures, to make it easier for engineers to be ethical, to make it easier for other, um, prof- you know, other members of your firm, your company, um, culture is the thing. Um, and when I talk about corporate culture, there are, again, there are two types of culture failures. Um, one is the, the causal culture failure. Um, that is the bad practice or the lack of practice that leads to the institutional failure. Um, it's the prioritization, sending the wrong message that profit um, is key over safety, over um, integrity. Um, it's ineffective management oversight. It's, again, allowing that that fraud, that, that bad practice to happen on your watch. Um, it's inadequate training. It's not giving people, not equipping people to recognize an ethical issue or to take an action if they, if they perceive an ethics issue. And then the second type of, cor- of culture failure that um, is, is a concern is that lack of corrective culture. Um, it, it, again, it, it, in, in, all of these, in all of these large failures and all of these systemic failures, um, there has almost always been an opportunity to correct it before something happened, before somebody was harmed, before there was um, you know, a grave violation. Um, but there was that lack of corrective mechanism, um, maybe the lack of will, um, um, and certainly the lack of um, you know, the lack of progress, lack of action um, in terms of correcting these problems. So, so again, corporate culture, you know, we we, we celebrate people who take an ethical um, course of action, you know, despite um, the the odds against them. But it's always obviously easier to be ethical if you're operating in a great environment. Um, in an environment that encourages ethics. Um, so if you have any takeaway, and now we often talk about ethics. Um, if, you, if you hear two people talking about workplace culture, they say it's the tone at the top. Um, and it's hard to argue with that. It is certainly true that ethical leadership um, is, is critical when you're talking about building a good workplace culture. Um, I, I, a quote that I really like that, um, that I think is, um, you know, it, it's very striking to me and very true. It was written actually by authors a pair of professors in actually an academic setting, um, but I think it's true about every culture. Um, and, sa- and they said, the culture of any organization is shaped by the worst behavior that a leader is willing to tolerate. Um, so it doesn't really matter if you have a code of ethics. It doesn't matter if your organization um, you know, has a value statement, has a mission. Um, what matters is what, what they do. Um, if you have a star performer who acts badly and gets rewarded for that. Yes, sorry. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, obviously there, you know, that's the, that's not going to, you know, people, what incentive do people have, um, if they are not, um, you know, if the leaders are actually encouraging bad conduct, why would anyone act differently? Uh, but I also think, and since I know I'm running out of time, um, it's not just about the top, um, every single person who's on this, this webinar, every single person in your organization has a role to play in building a workplace culture. Um, I've already talked a little bit about what the tone at the top is again. Um, walk the talk. It, it's not just about having the right, saying the right things. Um, it's about how you model them personally um, and how you provide proper incentives um, in the organization. You can't just put up, put together a code and say, this is our value. You have to live those values um, and reward, penalize or reward people proportionately to how they are living those codes and protect people that, that do come forward with an ethics issue or a concern. But I've actually, um, and again, if you spend some time reading some of doing some deep dives into some of these institutional failures, a lot of these failures happen at the mid-management level. Um, so the middle is, is actually critical. Um, the you know, people in the middle levels of the firm are often given those unreasonable or, or, or stringent expectations, you know, cost, budget, timing. Um, and if the message is sent wrong to them, they're the ones who are going to make those decisions to do something that's a cheat. Um, or violates a safety because they're trying to meet those unreasonable or, or at least difficult expectations. Um, so, so again, middle management is, is essentially critical to having a good workplace culture. If you are at that level, um, again, you have, to, you, have to per, you have to carry that message down, talk about ethics um, as it applies to your de- department, your scope, um, anticipate the kinds of dilemmas that you might see in your area of responsibility. Um, make yourself receptive to, you know, you, you know you're, the, you're the messenger. You, you should carry the questions up to the top. Um, if you have them, you should make yourself open to questions from people that report to you. Um, and again, make decisions consistent with your ethical values. 
Um, but again, even if you're at the lowest level, in, in many ways, the lowest level um, employees are a very important, again, part of this picture. Um, you know, it, it's very easy to be the toxic or the uh, you know, the naysayer that creates low morale. Um, if you're bringing your, your personal unhappiness into the office, or if you're the person that is actively at meetings, why are we doing this? What does this doesn't matter? You know, nobody really cares. Um, you know, you are that, you know, you, in, you have a very big sphere of influence uh, among the people that your peers or your colleagues. Um, instead, you should be supportive of people who care about ethics. Um, you know, if you see somebody who's doing something questionable, you know, you are the lowest key level of intervention. You know, you have the ability to talk to somebody if you're concerned about their behavior. Um, you are the person that can bring questions up to management. Um, if, if you walk away with nothing else from this, from this webinar, this would be my hope, which is to say that regardless of your position, ethics is everyone's responsibility. Um, so do what you can, make a personal commitment to living that ethical life um, and you are going to bring a positive change to your organization. Um, thank you for listening to me. And I really appreciate, um, again, the time to speak to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hope. That was an excellent presentation. Yes, you have brought out very lucidly the point that an organization's top leadership sets the tone for ethical behavior and practice and how the middle level leadership is key to its dissemination. Yes, everyone has a responsibility to walk the talk. Thank you very much. We will now move on to the panel discussion and Q&A from our online participants. Um, Mr. Shivasta, would you like to start? Justice Mittal, who would like to start? Um, I have a question for Justice Mittal. Yes. Ma'am, you have been part of the law and justice system since the early 1980s. Considering the large load of pendency in the courts, how can the judicial system really help in making society more accountable and a more transparent and corruption-free society? Is there anything that is in the works to improve uh, the situation? We are constantly monitoring our uh, you know, the justice, the functioning of the judicial system, you know, and to add speed and expedition to the processes, there's a huge effort at digitization of the entire, you know, not only the existing record, but to enable digitized filing of cases, digitized hearings, you know, we have a lot of courts are doing hybrid hearings and uh, to bring in further transparency and accountability, you know, the courts are live streaming the proceedings increasingly. And there's a huge effort. The, there's been a, several amendments in the law, especially in the context of commercial cases. You know, you have the Commercial Courts Act, which says no adjournments for the several reasons, which were the norm prior to the coming into the existence of these acts. But you know, again, some uh, ethical and uh, moral Decisions have to be taken by lawyers, you know, to not to ensure that there's no frivolous filing to, you know, further burden the already heavily burdened courts. You know. We a, a lot to do it do is with the judge population ratio, you know, the filing that we get and the number of judges. Uh, but a lot is to do with cases which ought not to be in the system at all, you know. Absolutely. And probably we'll be able to help the justice delivery you know, better, make it more expeditious. If everybody were took a conscious decision mm -hmm. not to file a case, say, if it did not have more than 50% chance of success. Avoid frivolous cases. Yes. yes. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, there's a question from the audience. I think uh, maybe Mr. Shivasar could take this. Has a framework been created for the compliance of ethics and integrity for the Consulting Engineers Association? And are any reports of violation and action taken against clients and members? Mr. Shivasa, would you like to respond? Of course. Oh, there is a framework. We have uh, developed a code of ethics, which has uh, uh, provisions covering a very wide range. And um, anybody who doesn't follow the code of ethics, there is a provision in these uh, rules to 
take uh, necessary action uh, as prescribed in the code itself against those individuals or the companies who are not following the ethics, ethics code. So the framework is already there in place and has been there for quite some time. Recently, in fact, uh, there has been a modification. It has been upgraded, updated, and uh, the latest version is already there. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Shivastha. Welcome. The next question is for Justice Mittal. What are your views on developing a culture of rewarding exemplary ethical behavior demonstrated by someone in a society where penalizing the guilty is much common. It is being realized that most of the people with power tend to misuse their position. This is from a young professional. Um, Justice Mittal, would you like to take that? Yes, yeah, so the, I, if I understand correctly, the question, the question is that uh, uh, we should reward ethical behavior instead of only penalizing, uh, uh, you know, misdemeanors. Is that right? Exactly. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> no, ethical. I think ethics should be and integrity should be a very way of life. You know, you should not look for rewards for being ethical. That's the principle by which I lived in, and uh, it pay, it by itself pays a reward enough. It's so satisfying, and it gives you strength. You know, because you realize you have no option. You know, I was once told by somebody that I have no choice. I said, "What is? Why not?" He said. I was told you have to follow the law. So, you know, if you know you have to follow the law, you're never in a quandary, you know. So ethical behavior by itself and being having the courage to follow ethics is by itself extremely rewarding. And I would suggest the young question person who's put the query to try it, you know, it did really <laughs> help you. Yeah. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, a question for, um, Professor Balla, uh, in your experience, how does monitoring the corruption perception index helping help in making a country more corruption free? I think all information is useful, right? The more information we have about the state of corruption in the country or in any country or across the world is useful in terms of making us rethink the kind of laws we have the kinds of cultures we uh, encourage, work cultures we encourage, and um, also the impact of corruption on our societies. Uh, without information, I think it's very difficult to actually plan anything ahead. Without information, it's very difficult to suggest to lawmakers that certain legislations must be passed. And without uh, information, it is very difficult to actually speak to your, uh, a general audience about the fact that corruption matters. So uh, I think uh, the rating of corruption, uh, you know, by Transparency Berlin, uh, the corruption scores, the corruption rankings, these are all important. As well, I think the kinds of surveys that we do, uh, you know, the, the regional corruption index that we create, the country corruption index that we create, um, all of these are very useful. There's one example that we have that uh, and this was certain RTIs across the country, across various states. And we reported that uh, uh, UP, Uttar Pradesh, did not have a commissioner, an RTI commissioner. And therefore, no RTIs were actually uh, you know, uh, placed before anybody. And as a consequence of our survey, the government in Uttar Pradesh instantly actually appointed an RTI commissioner so that this uh, institution would actually function. So there is, you know, there is an, a sort of exemplary effect uh, in terms of the surveys that we do, in the terms of surveys that other organizations do. Um, and therefore, I think the more information we have, the better. Absolutely. Thank you very much, ma'am. The next question for Mr. White. What if my organization does not have policies, procedures, or processes that establish and maintain ethics and integrity? Well, it's, uh, it's all about developing your own. And, and if your organisation is not there yet, there's plenty of examples available. Uh, so, for example, CEAI on a code of ethics on its own uh, would be a good starting point, either develop your own or subscribe to the ethics that are published. 
And then using other practical tools, such as, for example, the, the FIDIC integrity management system, which is in three parts, that would then be cascaded from the code of ethics. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. White. Uh, I have another question. Most domestic and international consulting firms have internal compliance documentation, but not much is heard in the public domain about the whistleblowers and follow-up action. Who would like to take that question? Justice Mittal or Professor Balla? Justice Mittal wants to go first. Yeah. I didn't hear the last part. I'm sorry, Sayona. Yeah. Uh, not much is heard in public domain about the whistleblowers and the follow-up action. Yeah. Oh, yes, you're right. It's part of the... Um, it's something which uh, is very, very important. And uh, so far as courts is concerned, you know, uh, there's a difficulty. We don't have any formal whistleblower protection systems. Mm. You know, we don't even have a very, very strong witness protection uh, uh, regime in place. Yes. There's a huge dearth of <laughs> legislation and uh, it's mostly guidance from judicial orders that is coming, you know. So the, and uh, certainly there is no practice of informing a whistleblower. Though individual enactments now are saying, for instance, the juvenile, uh, the POXO requires, uh, you know, the witnesses and certain sexual offenses also require that the complainant key is kept informed of when bail applications are listed, when bail orders are passed, when acquittal orders are passed or somebody's released from jail. But uh, there is not much guidance uh, in the overall scheme of things and nothing, no formal method of ensuring that the whistleblower is kept informed of what has happened to the information that he disclosed, he or she had disclosed. Yeah. Professor Thank Balla? Yeah. Thank you very much, ma'am. Professor Balla, would you like to add to it? Yes, in our country is really uh, scary, right? And I'm using the word scary with due consideration because many whistleblowers have actually been murdered, have they, they have been killed in so-called accidents. And we get a lot of, uh, not a lot, but we get considerable numbers of people who would like to disclose certain facts within their organizations, but there is no Whistleblowers Protection Act to actually protect them. And very often, the police or uh, the judicial parties, um, uh, you know, are to be some understanding in our society and within our institutions that whistleblowers are actually people with enormous courage who come up and say things that need to be said and they need to be protected because they are actually rendering a useful service. Um, but I think that doesn't happen very often. And more often than not, whistleblowers actually get victimized within organizations by their bosses, by their peers. Um, and uh, you know they often come to us with searing stories about uh, how they are dealing with the situation. So we, we are deeply concerned at, at TI about how to move forward on legislation that protects whistleblowers, because without that, you really cannot have transparency and you cannot have uh, you know, people willing to come mm -hmm. out and talk about things that are going wrong. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Balla. There are some comments which have come out in the uh, in the section. It has to be uh, moral integrity, responsibility, and fair transparency in the organization. Whether all consulting engineers practice ethics and integrity, how how it is evaluated and ensured. Uh, this, I think, would uh, I would ask Mr. Mal to cover when he's talking about uh, he's giving his concluding remarks because there are organizations which do have a policy uh, with respect to the code of ethics, ethics and integrity and everything. Uh, there is a question for Ms. Hoke. Ms. Hoke, in your considerable experience with various companies, have you come across a situation where the policies or the tone set by the top leadership 
has been just right, but the trickle down to the lowermost rungs have not really been effective. And why was that? This is based on your uh, experience with various companies. Well, that's a that's a good and tough question. <laughs> <laughs> Because I do think there can be a disconnect, and I and I did mention that that about the the middle management. Uh, I think um, communication can be a problem, and and whether you have adequate communication, and um, and and you can send mixed messages, so you have to be careful about your communication. Um, I can't think of any specific example offhand as far as an institutional failure, because you know it's really hard to have set the tone exactly right if it's actually not getting down. I mean that in and of itself is a failure to set the tone right. Um, but I've definitely seen situations where, you know, either there was a perception of a fear so that the information, so the people who were making decisions were not receiving the information that was needed from the lower levels to make that correct decision. Um, and that has led to the failure because, again, that's and, and whether that fear was legitimate or if it was just, um, you know, a perceived fear of retaliation, fear of losing the job. I mean, that's certainly there. When there's a disconnect between the people who are making these like life critical or safety decisions um, and the people who have the information that that is critical to make that decision, um, that's that is a recipe for failure. So, so I, to me, it's communicate. It's all about communication, and if there's lack of communication of the right messages, then then yes, you're you're going to have a problem, even if there is an intent to be critical. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Ms. Hope. Uh, there is a comment. Uh, from Mr. Sharma, in my opinion, CEI should be the watchdog for ethical practices by its members and take necessary corrective action in case violation is observed. Point well taken, provided they are willing. To be effective, it should be mandatory for all consulting firms to be members of CEI, your reaction. I think mm -hmm. our president would be very happy to hear that. Uh, the next one is why the rate of corruption this decreased in the year 2015 to 2018 and is gradually increasing after that. I think that is for Professor Balla. Even I noticed that. Yeah, well, um, partly I think it has to do with the fact that not enough cases are being registered, not enough FIRs are being registered. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, whether these are decisions taken at uh, judicial or uh, police levels um, to unburden their own books um, is always a question that we ask. Uh, and partly, I think there is also a fear of victimization. Um, as I said, uh, you know, we don't have a whistleblowers act. We don't have any protection for people who come out and speak. And the whole process of registering an FIR itself becomes very, very, a dangerous, be difficult. So I think, uh, you know, if we were at the ground level to consider two things, one is the protection for people who actually, you know, come out and speak. And secondly, the process at the level of the Thana, where the FIR is to be lodged, uh, that should be made simpler and should be made mandatory, actually, that somebody who comes to report a case should be able to report a case. But that's not often True. So I think both things, uh, you know, uh, matter here. But I think the more interesting thing is that till 2015, the RTI Act, the Right to Information Act, was very robust, right? And there was a great deal of uh, hope and there was a great deal of trust uh, in what it could do. Uh, uh, since then, I I think uh, both parliament, our politicians, uh, you know, as well as our politicians generally, uh, and our institutions that are supposed to uh, file uh, uh, right to information uh, applications and complaints um, have not done their job. They have whittled away at, I mean, parliament has whittled away at the RTI Act substantially and just taken away the teeth of the RTI Act. Uh, at the level of our commissioners, there have been fewer cases registered, fewer cases dealt with, and fewer, uh, you know, fewer decisions taken on cases. So really, this is an institutional as well as a legislative problem that we have. It is also a question of political will. I mean, is the government of the day putting its uh, force behind transparency and integrity in public life, uh, in governance, or is it not? What are the choices the government is today making? And I think we need to question that. 
The third thing, of course, is that I think civil society has been under attack uh, for the last four or five years, consistently under attack, with the result that the civil society institutions, which actually assisted people in filing complaints, have been whittled down. Their powers have been whittled down. Their, their, their ability to act has been whittled down. And I think this is a very, very serious situation because if you don't have a vibrant civil society, you will really not have the kind of watchdog functions that, that civil society performs. So, and, and, and broadly really, civil society, if you whittle it down, it is also dangerous in terms of being able to manage dissent in your society. So government no longer, it seems to me, or increasingly it seems to me, does not have a safety valve in a vibrant civil society. And can say to the government, these are the issues that you should be debating and legislating. Now, when you do all of that, um, I think, uh, you know, we, we are really confronting a very serious situation. I mean, to my mind, at least, we're confronting a very serious situation. So we can talk about integrity, we can talk about honesty, but unless we have the tools to actually, you know, push them to, we are not going to be able to move forward on it. Sorry, I've taken a lot of time, but yeah. this is okay. something I feel passionate about. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Balla. Mr. Mm -hmm. Shivasa, the next one is for you. You yes. mentioned that unethical behavior and practice are existent in our domain and a change is called for. What happens if that change does not come about soon? Disaster. That's one word. But uh, what is happening is uh, we are watching uh, the consequences of uh, these unethical behaviors virtually every day. Uh, you see the collapses of bridges, buildings, uh, accidents on the airports, on the highways, um, water logging uh, whenever it rains, uh, and uh, so many other things. The reason primarily is because the safety norms and uh, design are in execution, uh, they're just not being adhered to. The standard codes are there, the safety norms are there, but then the non-adherence is the prime cause. And thereafter, then the poor maintenance. We create something, but we fail to maintain it. And because of the poor maintenance, most of the things do take place. So the situation uh, is, uh, if not corrected, the number of adverse cases will only multiply. Can we afford that? That's why it is paramount to do something about it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Srivastava. Uh, there's a question, where can we see the framework for ethics and integrity? Uh, I presume that uh, the questioner is wanting to know about the CEI Code of Ethics. Uh, the CEI Code of Ethics is available on its website. And that includes uh, the aspects of ethics and integrity. Uh, there is another question asking us whether CEI can act like a watchdog or have a probe power. Uh, Mr. Shivasta, would you like to take that again? I don't think we have the wherewithals of acting as watchdogs. Um, in fact, if something is uh, coming to us by way of complaint, then only we can uh, look into those cases. But uh, we cannot uh, go out in the open and try to find out what is going amiss somewhere. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Shivastav. Uh, this one is to uh, Mr. White. My colleagues or clients have different views on ethics and integrity. Is my view incorrect? All comes down to the circumstances, Ms. Philip, and you know, truthfulness is is at the basis. If we can all work on that basis, then everyone says, well, if the truth is being told, that's great. Sometimes, though, uh, certain circumstances may prevent people from telling the truth if they don't feel safe in reporting something, if they somehow feel coerced or threatened into a situation. It may be that there's a, an opportunity later on after something is observed. So, uh, yeah, Working with your colleagues is about working out who your colleagues are and how you interact with them and they interact with you. Thank you, Mr. White. Uh, there is another question. Uh, where are 
where all consulting engineers practice ethics and integrity and how is it evaluated and ensured? Um, Mr. Shivasta, would you like to take that? Or Dr. Ajay Pradhan, would you like to take that? <laughs> Let the president take it. Whether all consulting engineers practice ethics and integrity and how is it evaluated and ensured? Well, Do we have I, some system? <laughs> no, as, as, as an apex body of consulting engineers, uh, we only follow if it is uh, somebody's doing mischievous things or mistakes it has come to our notice we take a, you know action and we don't have any enforcement action we keep writing them to not to this uh, practice and we have if they have signed our uh, code of ethics and they need to follow in spirit uh, you know uh, and the letter and uh, that's what we can only do we are not uh, we are an association body and uh, you know as an industry body we don't have those power to really enforce we can only just help them. Uh, we can provide them training. We can help them how to do a, a good business. And I think that's what we can do. Thank you, Dr. Prada. <clears throat> there is a very interesting question. Uh, why, why do unethical people unite and not the ethical people? <laughs> Mr. White, would you like to take that? <laughs> oh, for sure. I mean, it's. I, I think from what we've heard all the way through the webinar is that it seems strange that everybody who wants to act with integrity, who everyone who does act with integrity, somehow feels alone. Um, whereas, you know, the, the bad forces, if you like, always unite. And I think back to, I think there's a West African statement along the lines of, if you think that one voice won't change things, try spending a night in a room with a mosquito. Okay. So, <laughs> so the point being, of course, is you may feel like you're not united, but in fact you are. There, there is a saying that all thieves are cousins. <laughs> yeah, so thank you very much, Mr. White. The, there is a uh, question. from We have only heard the Indian view on whistleblowing, which is not at all respected in India. It has been successful in the West. And I would like to hear Ms. Hoke on it. It's okay if we don't have time. <laughs> so Ms. Hoke, that's yours. Yeah, yes. Well, there, there definitely is a legal framework for protection of whistleblowers in the United States. Um, you know, it's imperfect. Um, I think, um, I think, you know, the system can be abused a little bit. And so it, it, it is it is often kind of morphed into, you know, a battle, you know, a, a, you know, is, is somebody a disgruntled employee versus a genuine whistleblower? You know, are they so so there's, you know, a bit of a negative perception in many ways of whistleblowers, which is an unfortunate byproduct of that. Um, but I think when it works, it, it works exceptionally well. And, and it is important to have that 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 framework and and you know and, and to educate people that that legally you cannot be retaliated against if you are acting in a protected um so i do think um you know i, I think it's i think it's a tremendous benefit and, and i and i routinely get phone calls from people asking you know like reassurance that unfortunately i often can't give but somebody who has an ethical concern and they want to know what's going to happen to them if they step forward um, and, and, and I wish I could give that guarantee that, of course, because we have this framework, we're, we're going to be protected. It's not quite as absolute as that, but at least when it functions as it does, um, you know, it, it really is that that protection and is that incentive for people to. Um, in fact, we have, uh, sorry, um, interestingly, we have something in, in certain frameworks, which, which is called um, QUITAM, uh, which is basically um, a financial incentive for whistleblowers. Um, if there is fraud on a public project, um, and a whistleblower uncovers that um, we they they actually they and the government recovers some money they get a percentage of the whistleblower gets a percentage of that money um, so it's a tremendous financial incentive which um, is it, 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 again maybe leads to that perception of whistleblowers as maybe being out for themselves but um, it certainly is a tremendous encouragement um, for people to expose fraud when they know of it because they they might actually financially benefit from that um, yeah. so an interesting framework maybe not the perfect system but but it is. Um, it is helpful. Yeah, that, that last one might just work. Um, integrity and ethics are almost non-existent in society and engineering. How do we cultivate this as a norm and practice amongst the youth and professionals? 
Miguel Singh from Guyana, South America. Um, who would like to take this? Mr. White? Uh, just a, a general statement on the South American approach is that there is a lot of uh, anti-corruption, anti-bribery legislation in place, which is excellent. And of course, that's a civil code as opposed to what we're used to in the common law country. So quite well prescribed. <clears throat> However, there's always gaps in, in prescription. And one of the issues in, for example, Brazil is that it's illegal to give a bribe, but it's not illegal for a government official to accept accommodation off another person. So quite easily, <laughs> you can change from having no bribery here to, well, something that's questionable. So to the questioner there, I would say that in the Southern American codes, which in Guyana, for example, I'm not familiar with that legislation there, you may find that there are aspects of the law that almost legitimise corruption, but don't say enough about the way that you act ethically. And I think it's trying to find that those gaps and then say to yourself, well, there may be nothing in the law about it, but as a person, I should deal with it in a transparent manner with integrity. Yeah, and there's a follow-up question to that. What penalties can be enforced by engineering bodies to ensure preservation of integrity? Uh, Mr. White, you can take that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, well, I suppose, and from uh, noting that the, uh, the <clears throat> learned judge is with us, is that the only entities that we in society consider that can enforce a penalty is a court. And, and so if it was an engineering, engineering body that does enforce a penalty, they would have to have some legislation behind them. And then if I think to uh, Queensland in Australia, they have a engineering board that registers engineers. And if there's certain offences or events that occur, then a penalty applies. But the procedural aspect to it is very lengthy and very detailed and, and nothing is left unturned. But at the same time, if there's a frivolous or vexatious approach to it, it makes the engineering body look bad if they take action against someone who's, it turns out, is unsubstantiated as being unethical. So my, my only thoughts there are is that if, if it was an engineering body that were to apply a penalty, it would have to be well-documented, well-organised to do that. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. White. Uh, there is a question for either Justice Mittal or Ms. Balla. What, C, what can CEAI do to combat corruption from society, particularly in the consulting engineering sector? I don't know if you'd be able to answer that, but they want no, your views. You know, what I said was charity begins at home. So let's look inwards. You know, look inwards. You know, I, I gave several tests, which if you started looking at personally, as well as as an organization, you know, are you for being gender equal? And here I'm not talking only between the distinction between male and female, but you have the LGBTQ community as well. Are your policies you know, compliant with the law? Are you paying fairly? Are you giving equal, you know, the minimum wages at least, if not the most? You have all the, in countries like India, you have the, the huge corporations from the West setting up factories, Vietnam, you know, et cetera, and trying to maximize profits by undercutting the benefits which the labor ought to get, is that that's certainly unethical and it's Ill, apart from being illegal as well. So you look in, look within and begin with yourself, you know, and, uh, you know, ensure the, and, and small, small baby steps will take you a long way. They'll become a, oh, everything, good and bad is a way of life. It's a habit. And if you take those baby steps, you'll be able to ensure and infuse so much uh, ethics and integrity into your organization. You know. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there are uh, questions that are continuing to come, but I think we are running out of time. So uh, if it's okay, I will... Uh... Raise his hand. So he wants to say something. There's one more question. Sainaji, I, I yes. just, before Could you I control, just... I just have a one remarks I want to make. Just yes. before you come. Yes. Yeah, can, can I come in? 
Yeah, yeah, please. I, I just have a one quick question to Justice Mittal. Uh, Ma'am, it is a worldwide is a practice that uh, most of the consulting engineers One or con the... contractors, Sorry. contractors. Ma'am, in the worldwide practice, many organization, be it the government, a private organization, consulting or contracting, they all hire government officials, whether uh, during the VRA stage or after the retirement. In India, we have one hour, one year cooling up period and all. You know, it's, I, know, I don't know, how do you see that uh, the person who sits at the regulator come back with uh, the private sector, be a four-star general or maybe a, 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 maybe a commander, uh, you know, come back and help. It is, Madam, true that in you know, a consulting engineer, contract engineer, they need those, those uh, professional to help them in executing their work or delivering their projects. For example, defense projects or various other key critical infrastructure project we need. But why don't we, ma'am, in India, we make it as a official advisory services. And in that case, those people can be still in the payroll of those particular department of government and work for the contractor and contractor or consultant then comply and pay those kind of money as part of this thing. So that can make a system very, you know, transparent. Why I'm saying, ma'am, ma you know that uh, lobbying is, you know, it's not legal in India. In the US, it is legal. We have seen how much uh, is a corporate uh, lobbyist work for a Tata's and then got into trouble. You know, so there is always it happened, ma'am. My, my question is that also government officials sit as tomorrow I retired and the next day he's in the NGT or maybe some tribunal. And then you are also conflict of interest. That is why I'm saying, ma'am, as a legal fraternity from your side, why not uh, come back with the government that, okay, this, they can be still attached to government and support the private sector in executing and implementing key infrastructure projects. This, that's my question. No, it's a comment, actually. It's a very yeah. good idea. <laughs> right. It's a very good idea, Dr. Prasad. And uh, I think we need to take it forward. You need to suggest it to the powers that be to put in such a system in place. I've noticed this, this is in a lot of problem areas, you know, a lot has been said about cooling off periods, etc. You know, you see people who are in the public sector in high positions are doing big things in the private sector the day they retire, you know, they're even working as arbitrators in yes. cases involving the private sector. Yes. And I've always wondered as to how the objective would they have been when they were in office. Absolutely. when they were evaluating the work of people who are nominating them etc there's several several such areas you know and it's a very valuable suggestion you say that the talent should not be permitted to go waste they can help in execution of the contracts but uh, yours was really a comment it wasn't yeah, yeah that's right that's yes. that. yeah thank yeah. you uh, so just, thank you can i just say one thing please quickly yes yes please. so the last question that was asked uh, you know, um, uh, Mr. Srivastava has uh, spoken about the fact that when um, uh, engineers uh, are derelict, uh, we have uh, disasters, right? I mean, we, we recently had this disaster about the building collapsing in Gurgaon, for example, right? Can the CEAI, as an independent body, then, you know, get together and produce an audit uh, or a report on these uh, disasters and present it to the public, uh, not as a government report, but as a CEAI report, because you're all engineers, you're consulting engineers, you know what went wrong, or you, you can figure out what went wrong. And if you have a report can be presented to the public, I think that would be a very good idea because in, in a sense, it would also revive some trust in the public in the engineering fraternity. Uh, so uh, just a task for you all, I suppose. Suggestion. Yeah, uh, ma'am, this is something that has been debated within our uh, association. A lot of people have come up with a suggestion. Uh, the problem is mm -hmm. that we are a private uh, uh, association, you know, and we all our members are invariably, there are a few public sector companies too, but invariably we are all a mm -hmm. bunch of uh, private sector companies. Uh, so it could so happen that there would be a conflict of interest somewhere one of those uh, consultants could well be a member of ours, you know. So, so far we have kept away from this because the chances are there would be um, a lot of issues coming up with our own members. So it is uh, at one stage we had discussed with the also with the Asian Development Bank 
and they had also come up with some suggestions but when they put put it to the government the government was not for it you know they had asked us to do some kind of benchmarking standards for you know in the uh, that was in, uh, related to um, hiring of consultants you know mm-hmm. so uh, generally it is not one of those things as of now it is not one of those things which is encouraged for a body like cei to be doing i hope that answers your question but yes we have also felt sometimes that it's very important that we get into it but it would require the consensus of all our members and that that would not be easy yeah uh, so if no. uh, that is fine we can uh, i'll just request mr um, i would like to close the panel discussion and for the concluding remarks i would like to call upon mr arun mal former managing director tata consulting engineers and former president of cei to please give us concluding remarks mr mal the floor is yours thank you zaina i think it's been a very very lively discussion so i'm not going to recapitulate all that has been said but uh, on the honorable justice mittal dr pradhan Mr. Omesh Rivasta, Mr. Lyndon White, Mr. Tara Hope, Professor Bhalla, and all the other fellow professionals who have interacted, they have all given a very, very strong shot. And I think that ethics and integrity are a must. They must be brought forward into the mainstream. we are part and parcel of everybody's work repertoire it's very 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 few companies really practice it and uh, i had been a part of the tara group and so out there it was a corporate decision and every company was a signatory to it now there was a question as to how would you ensure it you do ensure because and can ensure it by appointing people all along in your organization down the line at various levels to be ethic officers to be able to listen patiently impartially and then take action you we also have a whistle blow <laughs> whistle blow policy so that that whistle blower is safeguarded you know each organization the professionals and even the fresh graduates they need to evaluate their own working with a with the professional work practices and responsibilities to public the client the employees and the organization itself the requirements of the profession and the aspirations of all concerned they need to be interwoven in a seamless manner so that the ultimate product is wholesome and meets everyone's expectation albeit in an ethical manner and now we have really moved on with ethics having to look at and consider the public good as the ultimate aim and ensure that whatever engineering we do is all sustainable but of course consumerism has been the bane but that is what we have to overcome you know to summarize again we could say that professionals should at no point of time adopt the chalta hai attitude that is anything goes attitude and be satisfied with mediocrity or even less which happens quite often and that's why we have failures they must be determined to do their best develop strive and do better and reach the top for that long term quality a zero defects culture and practice and goal of delivering every project defect free must be there 
ethics and integrity have to be the backbone. They must be practiced at all levels for which dedication to the profession, fair working, openness, disclosure, and transparency are all have to be operational and they would go a long way in ensuring that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for effectively summarizing today's essence of today's deliberations. Yes, ethics is an important aspect for any business, more so for a professional service like engineering consultancy. It relates to a model philosophy required to be practiced by an individual as well as an organization. In the long run, it pays off and elevates one professionally and personally. On behalf of CEAI, I would like to thank our esteemed keynote speaker, Justice Geeta Mittal, our panel speakers, Professor Madhubhalla, Mr. Umesh Srivastav, Mr. Arun Mal. A special thank you to Mr. Lyndon White from Australia and Ms. Tara Hope from the US for consenting to participate in this webinar outside of normal working hours. Most importantly, our audience from across the country and overseas, it appears, Thank you very much for your participation and making the interaction lively and interesting. My sincere gratitude for the behind the scenes effort by the CEI Secretariat, Director Mr. Maney, Ms. Sheena and all the staff. And of course, the ever supportive Dr. Ajay Pradhan, our president. Thank you all once again. Goodbye.